again, Dr. Swain. I invite you to turn with me in your Bibles this morning to the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 6. Our sermon this morning, our convocation sermon will be Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. Read with me together. In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood about him, above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The foundations of the thresholds of the temple at the voice of him who called out while at the temple was filling with smoke. Then I said, woe is me, for I am ruined because I am a man of unclean lips. I live among a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a, a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongs. He touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away. Your sin is forgiven. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I. Send me. Would you pray? Father, we bow in this moment. We pray, Father, in the minutes that follow, that you would consecrate for yourself a people anew. Set us apart for greater service. Set us apart for more marked devotion and commitment to you. We pray these things with earnestness. In Jesus' name, amen. We're thinking this morning in our time together briefly about consecrating ourselves unto the Lord. To consecrate really simply means to, to, to set apart, to, to sanctify unto, to, to recommit yourself unto. It's a fitting and right that, we, that you do this, that we do this at the beginning of the academic year. For all of us, faculty, staff, students, onlookers, trustees, lay people, all who are here today, because regardless of where you are in Christ and regardless of what your calling in ministry is or isn't, all of us as believers in Jesus, if we want to be more faithful to serve Him and more fruitful in that service, a renewed setting apart moves us in that direction. Moreover, to do that, it's good to come to terms with these passages in Scripture that remind us anew of the character of God, the character of Christ, the ministry of the Holy Spirit that confront us anew with the holiness and the sovereignty and the power and the majesty of our God. And we must confess this is a need, an urgent one, but it's also a, a counterintuitive reality. The society we live in in 2019, we are not given to pausing and thinking about waiting things. Busyness, clutter, triviality, entertainment, all of those things occupy our time and fight for our attention, and thus to pause and reflect on the grandeur of God is something of an interruption, but a needed interruption. Moreover, to think about this passage and our calling is helpful to remind us of the gravity of our work. When people ask me to describe in Western Seminary, there are a lot of different ways I describe it, but, but one of the most frequent ways I say is the campus is a, is a cheerful place. People are happy. Uh, if you were to be on our campus, you would sense people who love being here and love God's call in their life, and there's a, a winsomeness and a cheerfulness in this place. If you were to eavesdrop on the, the Vivian house tonight, what would you hear coming from the Allen family? Probably the most common noise is laughter. We're a happy people. I'm a happy man, though I'm serious about that work. And it seems to me there is indeed a, a biblical reality to that, that we are called to a, a winsome seriousness, a, a cheerful devotion, a, a happy sobriety as who we are in Christ, what he has called us to do. But there is a weight and a gravity behind all of this. 
It struck me anew uh, over the summer. I had the opportunity to preach in a number of different Southern Baptist churches. And as is often, you know, you do after you preach, you're out in the kind of the big foyer area, visiting with church members and greeting folks who want to come up and say hello. And uh, I was there. My wife was nearby. And uh, this young man came up to me like he was probably early 20s and big old smile on his face. And he came up to me and he said, you are awesome. And uh, I said, what was awesome? He said, you were and I said, uh, I said, well, that's kind. He said, no. I, he said, I'm, I, I'm going to do what you do. And I said, what's that? He said, I'm going to be a pastor. I'm going to be a preacher like what you do. I want to do that. That was awesome. And uh, he said, so, so like, what do I got to do to be a pastor? And, uh, and I said, well, it's, you know, there, there's, 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 there's a process there. And I said, uh, I said it, it's, not, it's not like you just don't announce it in exuberance in the foyer. I, I, said, uh, I said, number one, God has to call you to ministry. God has to call you to that. That's not something that we can humanly engineer, but, but God has to call you to ministry. I said, secondly, Scripture has to, to verify that calling. First Timothy 3 in place is that your life in, it, it aligns with that. I, I, said, I said, thirdly, a church has to recognize that and see that and, and affirm that calling in you. I said, fourth, you have to be prepared for ministry, and, and that's usually a process of mentorship and often studying a seminary like the one where I serve. And and I said, then fifthly, there's got to be another church who, who, who believes in you and, and wants to hire you, and they actually call you to come serve on, on their ministry staff. And he said, that's all it is? I am in. <laughs> Let's start this over. You're not hearing me well this morning. But he was a sweet young man, and who knows what the Lord is going to do or not do with them. But I was struck in that moment and knew of, of ministry is actually a, a very serious matter, is it not? Now, as I speak to you in the room today and those watching via live stream and video later, there are a variety of calling. Some of you in the room this morning are dead set on the mission field as quickly as you can get there. Others of you are dead set on the pastor as quickly as you can get there. Some of you in the room come to seminary this morning feeling God's call, having been affirmed in that call by a church, but to be candid, that's, that's a little opaque. And a part of your time here is to visit with professors and, and build friendships and involvement in a local church that helps to clarify that calling and, and give direction to that calling. And we're eager to do that. All those of you in the room today are, are not here for ministry. You're just in town visiting a friend, or you just kind of popped in and you want to see what's happening at Midwestern, and we thank you for joining us. And, and whether you, where you are on that spectrum, it is fitting and right and good to get a refresher in God's character and to be set apart for Him. What is going on in Isaiah 5 and 6? Well, we see the prophet, a prophet, who has a dramatic encounter with the Lord in chapter 6. Now, we, we tend to see chapter 6 and think about this prophet, Isaiah, who needed this encounter. He needed an awakening. He, he needed some sort of renewal, some sort of repentance to take place. He needed that. And the truth of the matter, we, we all need that. Hey, W. Tozer famously observed, the most important thing about you is what comes into your mind when you think about God. John Calvin famously wrote in his Institutes that you really can't know yourself rightly until you know and see God. And again, so much about us fights against pausing and reflecting and being challenging, being challenged by passages like this. What is more, we, we acknowledge that there is a particular offense in these verses to modern man, right? Because it collides with our culture and our personal senses of morality and what we want to do or not do with our bodies and our lives and our sexuality and all the rest. But we declare this morning this passage is good and fitting and right and worth being trumpeted from a thousand mountaintops. The prophet here, Isaiah chapter 6, he's here. The king of Judah, we know, Uzziah, has just abdicated his throne to death. History teaches us that King Uzziah died in approximately 739 BC. He became king at the age of 16 and had reigned for some 50, 52 years to be exact. And his reign was largely successful, largely faithful compared to, to other kings. But, but in his later years, as so often happens, pride festered in his heart. He became a lawbreaker. He brazenly entered the temple, treading on ground reserved for the priest, and God judged him and struck him with leprosy, and Uzziah died. Nonetheless, Uzziah was a popular king, and his death sent shockwaves 
throughout the kingdom. The throne was now vacant. The people were anxious about their future. Moreover, they were under a threat. The Assyrian Empire was on the move. They were the dominating power in the region. In due time, the Assyrians would overthrow them and conquer them and occupy their land and deport many of their people into slavery. And so this is a time of great crises. Additionally, it was a season of moral confusion and spiritual decay. There was a sense of crisis in the air. The people needed a fresh vision of God. Now, Isaiah, as is so often the case, he was dialed in on what was wrong with society. Chapter 5. He, he was accomplished at assessing and critiquing what was wrong with his fellow countrymen. Places like verse 8 of chapter 5. Woe to those who add house to house and join field to field until there is no more room, so that, so that you have to live alone in the midst of the land. In other words, this is like basically materialism. Woe to you who are, who are, who are stockpiling things and adding house to house and thing to thing. And he's calling out materialism. Verse 11, woe to those who rise early in the morning and that they may pursue strong drink. In verse 22, woe to those who are heroes in drinking wine and valiant men and, and mixing strong drink. I mean, he's calling out drunkenness. Verse 18, woe to those who drag iniquity with, with the cords of falsehood and sin as if with cart robes. In other words, who, those who indulge in a, in a hedonistic lifestyle. And it's about indulging and pleasing the self. Verse 20, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to you, moral relativists. You're reinventing social norms to fit your own standards and liking, rejecting the biblical standards. Verse 21, woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight. Woe to those who are filled with pride. Thousands of years later, man hasn't changed much. And if we're honest, preachers haven't changed much. Because this preacher, Isaiah, he is dialed in on what is wrong with society, and he is dropping thunderbolts, lightning bolts at it. And we all confess this morning as evangelicals and Southern Baptists, we are, we are pretty good at announcing what is wrong with the culture, what is wrong with Washington, what is wrong with politicians, what is wrong, 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 wrong. That's a part of the role of the prophet, Yes. But something happens in chapter 6. When he sees the Lord, his urgent concern is not over what someone in another town is doing. It is over what is in his heart. It is not over what is wrong with, with the relativists or the hedonists or the materialists or the drunkards. There's this urgency over what's wrong in his life. There's a crisis that he stumbles into. And that leads us now to chapter 6. The people want a vision, and they get one. In the year of King Uzziah's death, the prophet sees the Lord sitting on a throne. Now, these eight verses, quickly, just think of them in, in two kind of broad swaths. First is the consecration Isaiah experiences in verses 1 through 7. Then in verse 8, the commissioning Isaiah receives. This, this consecration Isaiah experiences, verse 1. The year of King Uzziah's death, I've referenced him. Isaiah sees, sees the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted with the train of his robe filling the temple. What does he see? Who does he see? Well, evidently, the prophet is now, is now, is now bug-eyed. He gets a glimpse here of the Lord. Now, our Bibles, those of you who have your, your Bible open and, and, and who, who read it regularly, as I trust we all do, sometimes you see the Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D in your Bibles, which is a reference to Yahweh, the God who is I am, the God who revealed himself to Moses in Exodus chapter 3, the personal name of God. Other places, it's, it's capital L, lowercase o-r-d, Title Adonai, or, or which means king or ruler. One is his name, Yahweh. One is his title, ruler, here. Now, the Gospel of John even gives us more clarity, and that is what Isaiah is seeing, who Isaiah is seeing, is the Lord Jesus Christ. He looks 
and he sees that the throne is occupied. Again, let's just pause here. Everything seems zany. Politics, culture, everything seems topsy-turvy. Everything seems like who is in control of what? Middle East, Asia, South China Sea, Europe, South America. It looks like it's accelerating at a pace of more and more disruption, more and more unpredictability, more and more volatility. And it's easy to ask who in the world is on the throne, but Scripture teaches us the Lord is on the throne. Additionally, many times in ministry, you find yourself, we find ourselves in a topsy-turvy context, and it seems like out of control, and God, what's going on here? I'm at this church, and they're being mean to me, and, 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 and where, where am I, what, what's, what do you call me to do? And it's easy to almost conclude that God is, is impotent and is not able to affect His will, or He's preoccupied with another galaxy somewhere, but I want to remind you that this Lord who's on the throne is a personal Lord. He is the one who has called you. He is the one who sets you apart. He is the one who is reigning over all. Now, what we see here then is this description that, that begins to amplify the character of the one on the throne. The, this, this, this train, he, he's lofty and exalted. He's, he's up high. You look up high to, you don't, you don't look down to a potentate, you look up to a potentate. Well, this one is elevated all the more. And the, the train of his robe fills. The temple. The train of the robe is a sign of regality, of, of sovereignty, of majesty. And the bigger the robe, the greater the one who wears it. So Isaiah sees this robe that, that, that is like flowing through the temple, filling the temple. There's no mistaking who is on the throne, the majesty of the one on the throne, the power of the one on the throne. But as though that needed to be clarified... Verse 2 teaches us, shows us that there are these seraphim, these angelic beings who are, who are above him, each having six wings. And what are they doing? Well, with, with two, they're covering their face. Why? Because the one on whom they're in proximity to, they are not worthy to see. With two, they cover their feet. Why? Feet a sign of uncleanliness. With two, they flew. They're, they're, they're hovering around. They're, they're floating around, flying around. And they are saying an antiphonal response back and forth, back and forth, calling out to one another again and again and again, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Holy, holier, holiest is the Lord of hosts. And, and they're occupied with this. They're, 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 they're startled by this. They're taken by this. And it just keeps going back and forth, back and forth, echoing through the chambers of the temple. Why? Because that is the attribute they are most struck by in that moment and in that place. And not to play games with this, you know, but, but again, they're not yelling love, 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 or grace, 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 or peace, 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 or there's a lot of things they could be saying. They're struck by holiness. And then they declare the whole earth is full of His glory. As I mentioned already, John chapter 12 tells us that they are seeing the Lord Jesus Christ, this pre-incarnate vision of Jesus, and His glory is on display, and they are smitten by it. My mind races to the Isle of Patmos. When John, in exile there, who referenced, who wrote of this scene in John chapter 12, when he encountered the risen Lord on Patmos, what did he do? He felt like a dead man. A similar response to response to these seraphim. Do you see the position he's set in? One of unmatched holiness, unmatched majesty. There is a clear distinction set apart from every created being, including even the seraphim. Notice verse 3. They call out, they're declaring that back and forth, back and forth, holy, holy, holy. Now, I don't know about you, but, but I think I might get bored doing that day after day, year after year, century after century, millennia after millennia, eternity past, eternity future. But then I am reminded 
If we were to somehow enter that scene and go up to one of the seraphim and tap him on the shoulder and say, you know, aren't you tired of saying that? Are you kidding me? They would respond. The holiness that is before us is so unspeakable, so unfathomable, so incomprehensible that we have not, we will not get over the character of the one in whose presence we are. That's verse 4. What happens here? The foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of him who called out while the temple was filling with smoke. It's this scene that, that, that shakes the temple. And there's smoke here, not produced by a fog machine. There's smoke here produced, generated by the presence and activity of the Lord. How does he respond? Well, we're about to see. Isaiah quickly is sobered. His first response is, woe is me. I, uh, I love reading presidential biographies and uh, do that. Can always have one or two going over the years. And to me, one of the most interesting and tragic presidents we've had in American history is Richard Nixon. And, uh, you know, if you look at what he accomplished before my time, I wasn't born yet, but reading, I mean, his administration accomplished a lot. I mean, he liked to play on the grand stage, international activity, going to China, negotiating with the Russians, navigating Vietnam and all the rest. And, uh, and, and kind of the great irony of Watergate is if anyone didn't need to break into the DNC to get reelected, it was Richard Nixon. Uh, they won, he won in a dramatic landslide that really had nothing to do with, with a few scraps of information from the Watergate Hotel. But the more you read about the Nixon White House and, 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 and memoirs and people like Chuck Colson and others, you learn of how everything in the Nixon White House was choreographed. And so, and so Chuck Colson would write about how, how when Nixon, President Nixon was going to meet with someone, how they, they would put these people through the ringers and they would come in and show them this and show them that and, and butter them up. And by the time they get action to the Oval Office to meet with President Nixon after this, this multifaceted, staged, choreographed process, you can have the mightiest men on the planet you know, melt like butter before President Nixon. They were in awe by being with the president in that Oval Office. That doesn't compare one ounce to the throne room. Isaiah is struck, and his concern, note, goes immediately from five and the condemnations of his countrymen to woe is me. This is, this is a dramatic moment that scares him to dead, death. Woe is a, is a word of, of, of self-renunciation, of self-judgment, of, of self-condemnation. And it's, it's not woe are they, it's, it's woe is me, not woe is she. It's, it's woe is me. I am, I am ruined. I, I am cut off. I, I am destroyed. He's not saying, you know, this is kind of intense and I might die, or this is kind of intense, you know, I, I might, I, 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 this could be my, no, he's saying, I, I am like dead. Woe is me. I am ruined. Why? Because I am a man of unclean lips. Yes, I live amongst a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Why the lips? Unclean hands, clean feet, unclean heart, unclean mind. Why unclean lips? Could that be because we're taught in Scripture from our Lord that the mouth reveals the heart? From the lips is the overflow of the inner being. And perhaps Isaiah is cataloging in a flash all those idle words, all those hypocritical statements, all those words of condemnation, those words of gossip, those words of deceit, those words of pride. All of that, Isaiah is struck by the holiness of God, and he is smitten, and he declares that he is a man of unclean lips, and that has been made plain to him by the fact that he 
has seen the King, the Lord of hosts. So what happens? Does Isaiah like, you know, fall into the abyss? The seraphim come to him and say, you're this isn't the half of it. You think it's bad now? It's about to get worse. You're about to get zapped by the one who occupies the throne. It's about to happen here. Notice verse 6. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongs. I imagine Isaiah scared spitless. My imagination, but scared spitless. If I were there seeing this scene, and then a seraphim comes at me with a burning coal, I'm thinking this is the fulfillment of my death, death sentence. But he comes, in verse 7, he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away. Your sin is forgiven. Here's the glory of consecration. God has infinite grace. He doesn't leave us in a state of contrition and brokenness and humility and repentance. So this is up. He's not a God who holds our head underwater. He's got to lift us up. He's not a God who tortures us with the haunting of our consciences. He's a God who forgives and lifts, lifts us up. He is the God who restores. And we're all here today as followers of Christ because in our own way, time, and place setting, we have experienced that in conversion. And perhaps as we start a new academic year, we need to experience it again, experience it again in consecration. I believe for the greater one is set apart by God, the greater one will be used for God. The lower one is brought in the presence of God, the higher one is lifted up in the cause of God. Isaiah here is, is processing. He's, he's reflecting. He's flying. Now he's been forgiven. Well, notice verse 8. Verse 8. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? That is a voice that has echoed through the ages and echoed into the lives and hearts of so many of us in the room today. For me, I was in college contemplating walking away from my college basketball scholarship and college basketball team. I had been converted my freshman year in college, began to sense in my own unknown way, a call to ministry kind of my sophomore and junior year. It became more more pronounced, more intense, more clear. And a moment of crisis in Romans 10 and 1 Timothy 1 and 2 and uh, uh, 2 Timothy and Titus and, and, and processing and then in their own way hearing and receiving that call, whom shall I send? And in that context, law school begins to seem awful trite. For me. In that context, a, a career in politics or some other profession seemed very second class. For me in that moment, it, it was just the natural, obviously, clearly, like, here am here, let me volunteer. Here am I. Here am I. Send me. You felt that somewhere along the way. So many of us have to be used most effectively for the Lord in such service. We must first be brought lowly before Him in consecration. So what Isaiah says, Here am I, send me. My uh, first commencement I got to preach was here in December of, of 2012. And we were in the old chapel, and um, just which is now the Spurgeon Library, and we were in there and, and uh, kind of packed in there for commencement. And I, I preached that morning, and uh, in the in the sermon, in the context of the sermon, I, I challenged the graduates who were there. I said, you know, don't be a minister who's about the business of building his resume. Don't be a minister who is here merely to get credentialed. 
Uh, don't, don't be a, a minister who's, who's about calculating, strategizing about, I can do three years here and can get promoted there and four years there and I can go here. Don't, 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 don't. I said, here's what you do. Toss your resume to the wind, drink a six pack of Red Bull and, and just like go preach to anyone who will listen. And I still believe that and still mean that. The passion to go and to preach and to teach and to minister ought to bring about us a little bit of reckless abandon. As a footnote, I got a letter in the mail a few weeks after that commencement sermon from an elderly lady who rebuked me for encouraging our graduates to drink alcohol. <laughs> Wrote her back very sweetly, informing her that Red Bull was a caffeinated drink, not a beverage one. But I would still say that to you this morning, but not on the back end of things at commencement, but on the front end of things at convocation. Let's be a people who are serious, who are cheerful, who know that calling, who believe that calling, who've encountered the Lord. We go about life and ministry with ambition and drivenness in good gospel ways to such a degree, there might be an uncle or daughter or parent or friend who thinks, you know what, they kind of act like a religious fanatic on occasion. That's okay. Would you pray with me? Father, we come to you this morning. We, we pray, indeed, a prayer of consecration. Father, help us to be faithful. Help us, Father, to, to be cheerful warriors who are pursuing you, living for you, going about the business with a weight, but with a joy, knowing and believing this year is going to be a great year for growth and for church and kingdom impact. Jesus' name we pray. Amen.